Welcome everyone to my online course for research methods in psychology. My name is Frank Lociavo and I am your instructor. I have lots of interesting things to discuss with you, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So far, we've learned how to assess or interrogate the validity of frequency claims and association claims. Now that we know quite a bit about the four key validities and the three criteria for causation, we're ready to begin assessing or interrogating causal claims. So, in this video, that's exactly what we'll do. After reviewing an interesting causal claim, we'll see if the research backing up that claim meets the three criteria for causation. And then we'll assess the author's conclusions based on the four key validities. All right, let's get to work. Here's an interesting claim. Thermal imaging can detect deception. Let's learn a little bit more about this research. This research was conducted by a team of Ohio University undergraduate students under my direction. Let's read through the abstract to get a better understanding of what this research study is about. We conducted an experiment to test whether thermal imaging could detect deception. Half of the participants were randomly assigned to be thieves by stealing money from an unattended briefcase. The other half were randomly assigned to be innocent suspects. Immediately after the simulated theft, we interrogated all participants, although we instructed them to deny any involvement in the theft. During the interrogation, we measured each participant's facial temperature using a consumer-grade infrared thermometer. We hypothesized that lying would produce physiological reactions resulting in elevated skin temperatures. Although nearly all group means showed that thieves had higher skin temperatures than innocent suspects, most of the differences were not statistically significant. However, we found that thieves had statistically significantly higher skin temperatures when asked about the actual amount of money that was stolen. Thus, we found that thermal imaging was able to detect that thieves had concealed information regarding the mock crime. Thieves also reported statistically significantly more anxiety from the beginning to the end of the interrogation. That's pretty cool stuff. Before assessing the three criteria for establishing causation, let's rephrase this claim so that it better fits the format of our questions. As we learned from the abstract, the researchers created a situation where half the subjects were thieves and half were innocent suspects. During an interrogation, thieves were instructed to deny their involvement in the theft. In other words, thieves lied during the interrogation while innocent suspects told the truth. The researchers used thermal imaging in an attempt to distinguish between thieves who are lying and innocent suspects who are telling the truth. So we can rephrase the overall claim by stating lying leads to higher skin temperatures. That's causal language. So it's essentially stating that lying causes skin temperature to rise. Is this claim justified? Remember, causal claims are appropriate only when they meet the three criteria necessary for establishing causation. Covariation, temporal precedence, and internal validity. Let's take a closer look at each. First, let's focus on covariation, which simply assesses if the two variables are related. We can ask ourselves, as the level of lying changes, do skin temperatures change? The answer is yes. According to the abstract, nearly all group means showed that thieves had higher skin temperatures than innocent suspects. More specific details are provided in the results section. When asked if they know who stole the money, thieves had higher temperatures than innocent suspects. Similarly, thieves had higher temperatures than innocent suspects when asked if they stole the money. And the same pattern emerged when asked if they had the stolen money in their possession. Thieves had higher temperatures than innocent suspects. The authors noted that the differences were not statistically significant, but there was a clear pattern of covariation such that thieves had higher skin temperatures compared to innocent suspects. So this study meets the requirement of covariation. Let's move on. Temporal precedence refers to the importance of timing. 
If the researchers want to claim that lying leads to higher skin temperatures, then the lying manipulation must come before temperature readings are measured. So we can ask ourselves, were thieves instructed to lie and innocent suspects instructed to tell the truth before skin temperature readings were measured? Yes, you know, clearly the answer is yes. That's exactly how the study was designed to be carried out. That means this study meets the requirement for temporal precedence. So far, so good. Let's move on. The final criterion necessary for establishing causation is internal validity. A research study is internally valid when there's only one plausible explanation for the differences we see. In this case, the differences in skin temperatures between suspects who lied and suspects who told the truth. In other words, is lying the only plausible reason for the differences we see in skin temperatures? Remember, internal validity is critically important for establishing causation. Because if another plausible explanation exists, then we'll be left somewhat confused because we won't know exactly which factor was responsible for the differences in skin temperatures. As I mentioned previously, it helps to ask ourselves if lying is the only difference between the groups. Because if the groups differed in some other systematic way, then that group difference might be responsible for the differences we see in skin temperatures. In these situations, the first question I ask myself is, did the two groups start off equally in terms of their skin temperature readings? They did. According to the results section, thieves and innocent suspects did not differ in terms of their baseline temperature readings. Thus, random assignment resulted in relatively equal groups at the beginning of the study. That's a strong point in favor of internal validity. In fact, random assignment should be able to address most questions we might have. For example, is it possible that the thieves were more likely to perspire, and that's why they had higher skin temperatures following the theft? Due to random assignment, that's very unlikely. By using a random procedure to determine which subjects are thieves and which subjects are innocent suspects, we can safely assume that most individual differences, such as perspiration rates, will equal out between the two groups. That's another strong point in favor of internal validity. Random assignment equalized the groups at the start of the study. If differences exist between the two groups later on, those differences are likely due to the fact that some subjects lied while others did not. What about this question? Is it possible that the thieves had higher skin temperatures because they were asked to walk to the faculty mailboxes? Walking, of course, can increase body temperature. Again, that's unlikely because according to the procedures reported in the article, innocent suspects were instructed to walk to the same location because that's where they were told to submit their extra credit request forms. That was a brilliant detail to include within the experimental procedures because it ensured that all subjects needed to take a short walk prior to their interrogation. That's yet another strong point in favor of internal validity. So overall, I think it's clear that this study meets the requirement for internal validity. If you're keeping track, we've determined that this research study is three for three in terms of satisfying the criteria necessary for establishing causation. So at least for now, causal claims stemming from this research seem to be appropriate. But before we make a final decision about the appropriateness of this claim, let's dive a bit deeper by assessing this study in terms of the four key validities, internal, external, statistical, and construct. Here's another brief reminder of the four validities with brief descriptions of each. If necessary, pause the video so you can review them. As I've mentioned, it might be helpful to remember the four validities in this order, internal, external, statistical construct based on the first letters of each, that's I-E, S-C, I-E, S-C, I-E, S-C. If that memorization strategy works for you, use it. Otherwise, try something else. All right, let's discuss how to further interrogate this causal claim we've been discussing. Okay, let's dive in. We'll start at the top of the table, which states that causal claims must be supported by an experimental research study. 
That's true. So was this research study experimental? Yes, it was. Experiments require at least one variable to be manipulated. In this study, the researchers randomly assigned half of the subjects to be thieves, who lied during an interrogation, and half to be innocent suspects, who told the truth during the interrogation. In other words, they manipulated lying in order to test the effects of lying on skin temperature. True experiments typically use special terminology. In this case, whether or not subjects lied was the independent variable, and skin temperature was the dependent variable. During an experiment, researchers manipulate an independent variable to see if that manipulation affects a dependent variable. So right from the start, we know this research study was experimental. And based on the analysis we just completed, we know that this experiment had excellent internal validity. It looks like we're off to a good start. Let's take a look at construct validity. We need to ask ourselves, how well have the researchers measured and manipulated the variables in question? According to the article, the researchers measured skin temperature from a distance of 2.5 feet using a $500 infrared thermometer. Temperature readings are relatively straightforward measurements, so I have confidence that this measurement was handled appropriately. I believe their line manipulation was handled appropriately as well. According to the article, thieves were instructed to deny their involvement in the theft. During the interrogation, they were asked relatively simple questions. For example, the interrogator asked if they had the stolen money in their possession, and for each question, suspects were able to respond either yes or no. So, generally speaking, I think the variables were measured and manipulated appropriately. And that the construct validity of this claim is quite good. The lying manipulation was particularly well done. After all, how often do you read about student researchers carrying out a simulated theft followed by an interrogation? That's good stuff. Next, let's assess statistical validity. The article features relatively simple statistical analyses, mostly just means, standard deviations, and t-tests comparing thieves with innocent suspects. Although the statistical analyses appear to be appropriate for the data, the results are somewhat mixed, so there's not as much evidence for this claim as I'd like to see. If we're going to accept that lying leads to higher skin temperatures, then the data needs to back that up. But as we discussed previously, most of the differences were not statistically significant. For example, as we can see right here, thieves exhibited higher skin temperatures when being asked each of the three questions about the theft, but the differences between the means are relatively small and they're not statistically significant. That said, some of their results are compelling. For example, when asked about the amount of money that was stolen, Thieves exhibited the highest skin temperature when asked about $30, which was the amount of money that was actually stolen. That's an interesting analysis, and it's statistically significant. It demonstrates that the thieves had guilty knowledge. They knew something about the crime that others wouldn't know, and their skin temperatures gave them away. That's good stuff. And check this out. From the beginning of the study to the end of the study, the self-reported anxiety levels of the innocent suspects did not change. Thieves, however, reported statistically significantly more anxiety as the procedure moved forward. In other words, lying made them anxious. That particular analysis provides evidence that the interrogation was realistic enough to make the thieves uncomfortable lying about their crime. Again, that's good stuff. But still, most of the key analyses, the ones that compared skin temperatures of thieves and innocent suspects, were not statistically significant. So it's tough to put much faith in the claim that lying leads to higher skin temperatures. For that reason, I find the statistical validity of this research claim questionable. To trust this causal claim, I'd need more compelling evidence. Let's wrap this up by assessing the external validity or generalizability of this claim. To assess external validity, we need to know about the research subjects 
so that we can assess who they might represent. If they represent a large, diverse group of people, then we can generalize the results of the study to large groups of diverse people. But that's not the case for this research. According to the article, the participants were 101 students from Ohio University's Zanesville campus. They were mostly female, and they ranged in age from 16 to 60. That's a pretty good range of ages, but the entire sample consisted of college students in southeastern Ohio, and that's a relatively small segment of society. Furthermore, the experimental procedure relied on a mock theft, not an actual real-world event. So it's difficult to know how well the results would generalize to real criminals who lie while undergoing actual interrogations. But let's be fair, if anything, real life events would likely create more anxiety and potentially larger spikes in skin temperatures. And here's another important point. This study was designed to test a theoretical question. It was designed to test if thermal imaging could be used to distinguish between liars and truth tellers. In other words, this research was basic research, even though the potential applications of this basic research are easy to see. Long story short, this study relied on a small sample of college students, and it focused on an artificial event, so the study's external validity is relatively poor. But honestly, that's pretty common for basic research testing theoretical questions about human behavior. All right, let's assess the overall validity of this claim. The construct validity and the internal validity were both excellent. Because the results were relatively weak, the statistical validity is questionable. And due to the small sample and the artificial nature of the simulated crime, the external validity is relatively poor. So overall, I find this claim to be questionable. It's tough for me to put much faith in it. And I think the authors would agree. In the discussion section, the authors warned that until there is more positive data, we will remain skeptical, but optimistic about the potential promise of this relatively new technique. I think that's an honest way to form conclusions from the results of this research project. All right, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because I'll have more to say about research methods in the next video.